It's no secret that Australians are increasingly mad about their SUVs. But did you know that about one in seven of all new vehicles sold this year are classified as small cars? And we're about halfway through a massive mega test right now with 10 of what we consider to be the best small cars that you can get. In fact, the 10 we've got assembled make up more than 90% of all sales in this part of the market this year. Come with me now as we attempt to sort out the wheat from the chaff. Right, so we've got the 10 here. Before we begin, I will make the qualifier that we're testing all of these in their most luxurious form, so you can see the full suite of features that are available. All wear sticker prices of between 30 and 40 grand. Head over and read the written component of this review at Car Advice for more information on that. So the first car, the Ford Focus Titanium. Now made in Germany, still got really great performance and perhaps most importantly of all, a far more resolved interior than its predecessor. Next up, we've got the Subaru Impreza 2 litre IS. Lots of equipment for not a lot of money, super spacious interior. Has to be said though, not the most fun to drive if that's your thing. If a punchy engine and agile performance in corners is your thing, it's hard to go past the Holden Astra. Sensational value for money too, but man, that interior is starting to feel a little bit dated. Another of the more dynamic to drive is the Hyundai i30 N-Line Premium, but it also brings a really sophisticated interior and a massive sunroof and really good value for money considering the amount of equipment you get. If cutting your fuel bills is your top priority, it's impossible to look past the Toyota Corolla ZR Hybrid, the only petrol electric car here. But unlike previous Corollas, it's also got a really nice interior, pretty pokey in the back seats though. Ah, the Volkswagen Golf, the car that has probably won more comparison tests than any other in Car Advice's history. It's still the benchmark when it comes to refinement and smoothness to drive. Just be careful ticking the options boxes though, because that premium experience also commands a premium price tag. I feel like I don't have to say too much about the Mazda 3 G25 Astina. Just look at it. It's absolutely gorgeous and it's just as nicely designed inside as well. However, the price tag is high, the boot is small and the back seat is a little bit pokey. May I present the Très Chic Peugeot 308. It's getting on in years, but it's still really nice to drive and look at and fantastic value for money these days as well. Next up, the Kia Cerato GT, the slightly angrier twin under the skin to the Hyundai i30 N-Line Premium. Same drivetrain, but slightly stiffer ride, plenty of equipment inside and being a Kia sensational value for money with a benchmark warranty. And last, but definitely not least, we have the Honda Civic VTi LX. The most spacious interior, the biggest boot and absolutely massive storage option but also pretty spirited to drive and decent value for money too. Not quite sure I'm into the fussy design though. All of these cars have some fantastic attributes and there are reasons to buy any of them depending on your needs. However, we have managed to narrow down 10 to our three favourites and they are... The Mazda 3 G25 Astina, the Toyota Corolla ZR Hybrid and the Volkswagen Golf 110 TSI Highline. We've decided that these three cars are the very, very best at meeting the different attributes that make a small car great. Those attributes include cabin space and comfort, the kind of features and technology you get, ride and handling, engine performance and fuel economy, and of course, value for money. Now that we've got our three, let's show you why we think these excel so well. Right, jackets off, let's get stuck in. Cost. The Mazda 3 G25 Astina is the most expensive car out of the 10 here at $37,990 before on roads. And that's $1,500 more than the Golf. However, it's also the most luxurious inside and is absolutely brimming with features. The Toyota Corolla ZR is actually one of the more affordable cars here at a smidgen under 32 grand before on roads as tested, which is really impressive when you consider the fact that it's the only petrol electric hybrid on test. And if you have a look at the specs side by side, which you can do on the written part of this review, you'll see that it doesn't really miss out on any core equipment either. The Volkswagen Golf 110 TSR Highline costs 36,490 before on road costs. So it is the second most expensive car here. Nevertheless, I reckon it's pretty good value for money considering the company has been steadily adding more and more equipment as this generation of car ages. Do you remember the days when Toyota Corollas were boring and beige to look at? 
Not anymore, right? This car looks fantastic. I really like its squat stance, its good proportions. It's not quite the science experiment that the Prius Hybrid is, which is really good, though those blue badges are a dead giveaway of what's under the bonnet. If the Golf was something from your wardrobe, it would be an immaculately tailored but conservative suit. There's really nothing all that adventurous going on, and unlike the other two that rely on fancy lights and shiny things, the Golf is a really basic and austere design, but the proportions are spot on, and those big side windows mean you can actually see really easily out of the interior. First impressions last, and in that sense, the Mazda 3 really shines. I mean, just look at this thing. It looks like a concept car that's made production. This beautiful soul red paint really stands out. You got this blacked out grille, those menacing slim feline style headlights. The massive C pillar at the end does polarize, but as far as style goes, this car is absolutely ahead of the pack. Usually when we do interior presentations, we've got to turn the engine off, but this is a hybrid car, so it's completely silent at idle, which is really cool. Toyota's made a bit of an effort in the design of this interior. You've got this nice screen here, though it lacks Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, the only car on test to lack those features. The build quality is typically bulletproof. And look at some of these racy bits. You've got bright red bolstering on the one-piece bucket seats. You've even got red sort of fake leather on the transmission tunnel here, which is really cool. Spending time in this is not like spending time in Corollas of old. There's actually some imagination and some thought that's gone into it, but it's still bulletproof in the way it's put together. So a massive improvement. Now I mentioned before that the Mazda 3 has the highest price here, but luckily its interior also feels the most sophisticated in that market. Everything is soft touch and tactile from the Nappa leather on the seats to the beautiful padded bits on the dash. Beautiful head up display giving you all of your information. A nice big 8.8 inch screen controlled by a rotary dial rather than touch. Everything is driver oriented. The whole cowl wraps around you and faces you so it gives it a really sort of racy, coupe like feel from behind the wheel. It's true, it's a bit of a stereotype, but no door makes quite the same thunking sound as a Volkswagen Golfs when closing. Um, there's not gonna be a whole lot of design awards handed out for the interior, but everything's incredibly ergonomic and well-placed. Their breadth of steering wheel and seat adjustability means anyone of any size can fit. I love this screen here with kind of naff, but kind of cool gesture controls. The build quality is typically Teutonic. Everything's soft and solid. Probably the only downside I can really find is the cheesecloth-esque cover for the sunroof, meaning a hot Aussie summer's day is going to be a little bit uncomfortable. I think Volkswagen could do better. To be honest with you, it feels a bit unfair for me to be judging back seats in any of these cars, given I'm 194 centimetres or about 6'4 in the old money. A bit too tall for these things, but as you can see, the rear seat space in the Mazda 3 isn't its strong suit. To be fair, there's plenty of knee room and foot room, but the headroom's pretty limited, and that side window and the big C pillar means it's a little bit hard to see out. If you're practicality minded, the Mazda's probably not the one for you. The back seat of the Corolla is a similar story to the back seat of the 3. Not a whole heap of room for someone of my dimensions, but you know, my leg room's relatively good. At least these seats are nice and soft. Vents there, cup holders here, no door storage pockets. Visibility outward is better than the Mazda, bigger side windows, which is a real win. You know, not the worst on test, but also not the best either. Germans are pretty tall, so it should be no surprise that the Golf is the most comfortable of the three in the back seat. Uh, definitely better knee room and foot room than the other two finalists. Clearly more headroom as well. Those big side windows means it's quite easy to see out. Nice big armrest with cup holders, air vents. Look, if you're going to buy a small hatchback from the three finalists to actually carry four adults around regularly, uh, the Golf is obviously the one to go for. Now when I say the boot is the smallest on the test, it's not offensively small. You can still fit a couple of suitcases there. You've got this good parcel shelf here that's removable. Really nice deep pile carpet lining. And under the floor there is a temporary space saver spare wheel. Every car here but one has that function. Do you remember how I said before that the Golf had the most practical back seat on test? Well, that also extends to the boot. 380 litres makes it the most capacious here. I know what you're thinking, that doesn't look particularly deep, but it has a party trick. You can lower the floor, giving you even more space. Clever stuff. We've criticised most versions of the Corolla for having a ridiculously tiny boot. Luckily, the hybrid ZR is the one exception in the range. 333 litres is quite decent. The caveat to that, though, is unlike the rest, there's actually no spare wheel at all. Instead, it has a patch kit, which frankly is an inferior solution. We're in the Corolla now, and do you hear that engine? 
exactly. This is a hybrid car, which means that car park speeds like this, low speeds, it actually runs on full electric battery power. Uh, but unlike previous versions of the hybrid, when you actually put your foot down and the petrol engine kicks in, it's far more seamless. You hardly hear a thing. And the CVT gearbox is a lot quieter than before. Once upon a time, you'd rev the engine and it would suddenly flare up and be really undignified. Toyota's done a great job of getting rid of that. Uh, this new Corolla is ridiculously fuel efficient. Um, on one of the efficiency loops, we managed to get 3.5 litres every 100k, um, but the actual claim is 4.2, which is still miles better than anything here. It drives really, really well. It's got really darty steering. The new TNGA Toyota Global Architecture is excellent. It, uh, it, it has really good handling and body control. The steering's quite direct. It's relatively good at NVH suppression. Really, really big fan of the Corolla. Um, again, though, like the Mazda, you do feel a bit hemmed in. You've got that big C pillar. It is a bit hard to see out of. And probably the one time where the hybrid drivetrain gets a bit unrefined is up a hill like this. Uh, the engine is working a little hard, as you can hear. Uh, I do like the fact there's a sport button though. You can hit the sport button and it actually sharpens up the throttle response. And it's far from a hot hatch, but it still has a bit of pep and a bit of get up and go. It's a really unique selling point in this segment, the Corolla Hybrid. Um, massive fan, especially if fuel economy is your priority. So we're behind the wheel of the Mazda 3 now, and I love the driving position. You sit nice and low in the car. You've got a head-up display giving you all the information. The gauges and instruments wrap around you, so you've got a really nice sporty feel. And fittingly enough, it drives in that way as well. Really spirited dynamics, great handling, great steering, just like all Mazdas before it. But it's also much quieter than before. Its NVH suppression is good and a lot more comfortable over that patchwork inner city road that you're, you're really used to. That blind spot, uh, which is the price you pay for the cool slinky styling, is massive and can be annoying at times, even though you have blind spot monitoring in the mirrors. The 2.5 litre naturally aspirated petrol engine is the highest displacement here. Not the most powerful, 139 kilowatts, and you have to give it plenty of revs to get the most out of it, but it is smooth and it is responsive and not as bad on fuel as you think. My take on this car is that it really blends the best of the old one with many, many improvements that make it a fantastic effort. There's something so relaxing about driving a Volkswagen Golf. It just kind of wafts along over bumpy and corrugated roads like you find everywhere in the cities. The ride quality is great. The noise suppression is really good. The steering, look, it's really light and easy to manoeuvre. It's not pretending to be a sports car. Uh, outward visibility is great. You're not hemmed in like you are in the Mazda or the Toyota. You've got massive side windows, thin pillars. It's really easy to see out of. The engine looks pretty small on paper, a 1.4 litre turbo, but it's got 110 kilowatts and 250 newton metres uh, right off idle point. So when you punch the throttle, it's actually quite responsive. And I should point out also that the double clutch gearbox is much smoother than before. The DSGs used to be really jerky around town, but nowadays they're actually quite refined and smooth for urban driving. So look, it's getting on in years, but it just remains so good to get around in. I can't tell you how hard it was to narrow this field of 10 cars down to just three. I think what really stood out for me is just how strong the competition is in the small car market. And it's really easy to see why vehicles like the 10 behind me are so popular. As I said before, there are reasons to buy any of them. And really we're choosing just three of the best, not the definitive three best. Please, if you wanna know more about any of these cars, do head over to caradvice.com check out the written component of this review. We've got full galleries, information, tables, and you name it. And as ever, let us know what you think, potentially which car you would prefer, in the comments below.